much time we got here for this? I forgot this one. As long as it's long. <laughs> <laughs> it's dangerous, you know. Last I, night we were up until 3 o'clock. It's awesome. You got to watch that. Okay, well, uh, my goodness, where to start? I've been doing this for a very long time, my, my whole life in one sense or another, but I first uh, really became identified as a wizard, specifically, back in 1980 or so. I mean, my whole path has always been on the path of wizardry, but I, uh, being a wizard is something which, in, you know, you tend, at least in former times, not so much to claim for yourself as other people start calling you that, and eventually, I mean, it's, it's, it's changing now, of course, but in those days it was, you know, you get enough people starting calling you a wizard and eventually say, okay, I'm a wizard, you know. But uh, in my case, there really is quite a lot of uh, background to it and, and enough training and such. But um, I'm hoping to bring all of that back and, and offer it as we are, in fact, doing with the, with the books in the school. But I'll, I'll tell you a little more about that. Um, I started college in the first year of the 60s, in 1960, and in 1961, the spring of my college year, um, several very significant things happened. One of them was, uh, well actually, sorry, cancel that. I started college in 61, it was in the spring of 62, that several significant things happened. One of them was two very important comic books first started coming out. One was Spider-Man, the other was the X-Men. And um, the X-Men featured a unique school for gifted youngsters run by Professor Xavier, whom at the moment, after months of chemotherapy, I'm beginning to resemble far more than my you know, preferred <laughs> archetype. But, uh, <laughs> that will all change, you know, and I'll get to watch the whole thing reverse again. Um, and uh, another book came out around that time, and actually it came out in late 61, but I didn't read it until 62, and that was a book called Stranger in a Strange Land by Robert Heinemann. And all these were extremely influential to a young freshman college student. And I pursued in my studies, I pursued um, um, educational uh, curriculum as well as, as well, pretty much everything. I pretty much cleaned them out and what they had to offer there. I mean, I, I packed my schedule every year with everything in the natural sciences and history, anthropology, archaeology, pre-med, astronomy, physics, everything really. I wanted to know everything, you know. So. Mm -hmm. But I was particularly interested at that time. I was thinking, well, you know, it would be really neat to someday have a school and be able to teach really gifted kids and stuff. I had that vision. So I studied the Montessori system and I studied uh, uh, A.S. Neal's Summer Hill system in, in England and various other experimental educational models that were being put out at that time, the Waldorf. There was really quite a lot of that going on. People were trying to develop new and radical types of education. I studied all of these. I was very interested in it, but Stranger in a Strange Land took me in a slightly different direction. Um, after my best friend, had, Lance Christie, had received the book and read it, he turned me on to it. And a crucial element of the whole book, uh, well, there are several, but one of the crucial ones is the concept of water sharing, where, where water is treated as the ultimate sacrament. Which, which I actually come to believe it deeply to be. And the sharing of water is a, um, is a, is a really deep right of, com of communion and bonding and kinship with somebody else. It's like the old blood brother kind of a thing, you know, but in this case, water is thicker than blood. And it involved a commitment to, to a way of life that was kind of outlined in the book as a model. And Lance and I decided that, that we really wanted to go there. So we shared water on April 7th, 1962. And our lives have never been the same since. And we have remained closest friends ever since, and still are. And one of the things that where this took us was in, uh, in the book, in the story, it's about a, uh, a first voyage to Mars, or our first manned expedition to Mars, which we're still waiting for, and hopefully <laughs> they'll still come in our lifetimes, that crashes upon landing and everybody's killed. But one of the women, was pregnant, and the native Martians, who were this ancient vegetable race, as it were, um, were able to save the baby. You know, at least that was one, and they raised him up. Well, now we've done some interesting stuff with this. We've raised up chimpanzees and gorillas and taught them sign language and how to do things and make stuff and do th and all that. Imagine if, after 
they have learned all these things that we can teach them, including language that can communicate with each other. We sent, they, we sent them back to the jungles, you know, to uh, bring that back to their their people. What would that be? I mean, because here's an influence of a vastly superior culture that teaches them all stuff and then sends them back. Well, that's what happens in the story because about 20 years later, a second expedition manages to get it together and go there, and, and um, they're a little better equipped this time, and they've got anthropologists on board, and, but they still don't know what they're going to find, and they find this 20-year-old human who's been raised by Martians. They bring him back to Earth, and with the, with the perspective of an alien anthropologist, the character whose name is Valentine Michael Smith, um, looks at everything of our earthly culture with totally new eyes from the outside. You know, it's like, you know, fish can't see the water they swim in. And we can't really see the culture we grew up in. We take it for granted. But this was a book that introduced our culture to ourselves as something not to be taken for granted of. And one of the things that in order to, uh, to affect the world in significant ways, because the implications of this thing mean you, if you're looking at things in different ways, you kind of think, well, Maybe things could be different if we, you know, what, what, what can we do to make this a better place? What do we need to change? And we're always doing that. We're all, everybody's involved in that in some way or another, trying to make the world a better place. It's, and um, uh, he comes up with the idea of starting a church. Because religion in, the, in America is, as to quote Robert Heinlein, a null area in the law because of the First Amendment. Congress will make no law respecting the establishment of religion. Or, uh, or, or governing the free, the free exercise thereof. Nice, it's nice. We're the only country that has this. You know? mm -hmm. So that's what they do. They started, it's called the Church of All Worlds. Well, we thought, you know, that would be really cool to do that. And we started getting together with other people. We turned them onto the book, and they liked it. We gathered them in, and over the next several years in college, we had a substantial group of people, about 100 people, all committed to this. So the direction that our lives took then over the years, and I'm, I won't go into too much more detail on that, that's another whole presentation, took us in the direction of developing a church instead of a school. And so the Church of All Worlds we did, and it's it's a going thing, and it's it's been really fascinating. It's had an enormous influence in the world in many ways. Many of the things that we experimented with and started out with in the CAW have now become deeply embedded in the larger pagan community in ways that people would hardly recognize who grew up with these traditions, but, but this is where they came from. But if you really want to know, just go read the book and you'll see how many things, wow, that's where that came from? Because these are the things that we actually did. We were the very first legal church, as far as I know, in all of history, to legally ordain women as priestesses, for example. I thought that was pretty cool. That was a major thing. And we were the first uh, uh, modern church to embrace the concepts of, pan of pantheism, you know, that, that uh, divinity is imminent in all life, everywhere. That and therefore, we all participate. We were all like drops of water sprinkled from a fountain, you know. And we're all part of the same unity, which is here where the, the symbolism of water just permeates everything. But, and so we all share in this divinity, which is expressed in the book by the phrase, Thou art God which we say is, thou art God, thou art goddess, you know, thou art divine. Again, this is an ancient realization that, that one finds in many other cultures, but it is not part of the Western tradition particularly. So we did all this stuff, and many years went by, many decades, and many amazing adventures, and, uh, and many tales to be told, which I won't be able to tell here in a limited time. But uh, after all this, and I, you know, and I created a magazine, Green Ape magazine, which of, of which here in this little book you have a, a, a nice little sampling of some of the seminal articles published over a 40-year span. The magazine started in 1968 as a little one-page newsletter, and it grew into a full-scale, really fancy, slick magazine. And now it's an online e-zine, so you don't have to waste paper and, and we don't have to pay for mailing, which, which is nifty. But these, the articles in here, um, are ones that affected and shaped and influenced the emerging pagan community because Green Egg was the first journal of the larger community, of everybody. Because that was part of our vision with CIW, the Church of All Worlds. We didn't really, we weren't just interested in our own little thing. We really wanted to 
create something, a, a game big enough that everybody could play, you know, and invite everybody to the table, you know. And um, we weren't particularly fussy that everybody had to follow our particular tradition or path. There's, there's two basic models for religion, you know. There's the belief-based religion, in which it's all about, do you believe in the same things as everybody else in the group, you know. And, and uh, Christianity is like that. It's very important. That's why you have thousands of sects of Christianity, because they're all arguing about tiny little details of belief. Which end of the egg do you open? That kind of stuff. And that's what belief stuff takes you to. And again, it takes you to holy wars and all kinds of nasty stuff. But the other model is, um, is, is more of a tribal model, really. It's, really, it's based on community. It's, it's based on you show up. You know, you participate in the events. You show up for bar mitzvahs. You know, you show up for weddings and funerals. And you have seasonal celebrations and other things that everybody participates. Nobody cares what people believe. You know, it's, it's you're showing up as you're being there. You're participating as the essence. And that's that's the tribal model. And that's the pagan model. We were the very first, uh, the first group, the first modern religion to use the word pagan as a self-identification. Prior to this, people used the word pagan. Those pagans over there, those, those pagans need to be converted. We've got to send missionaries to those pagans. Those damn pagans. But we were the first ones. I was the first one to actually claim the word and say, us pagans. And um, we promoted that as an identification for the emerging new earth-centered green religions that, that started coming out of the hippie movement and the kind of a thinking that was involved in that. And these were inspired out of the 60s by the civil rights movement, the hippie movement, the feminist movement, the environmental movement, the science fiction community, you know. All of these things were roots that fed into the tree um, and, and the, the trunk of which, you know, and the seeds of which were the church of all worlds. But the branches then continued to spread out and to develop an entire vast worldwide pagan community. And, and as the fruit grew and matured and ripened and dropped, you know, new, new trees and new forests spread up all over the place, all over the world. There's now estimated by, um, by Christian organizations that try to keep track of the numbers of world religions, they presently estimate the number of modern pagans in the world at over 10 million. And that's, that's not bad, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Back in the day, you know, I could count the number of pagans in the country on the fingers of one foot, and now there's 10 million of us, and we're everywhere. And we are everywhere. Everywhere we go, there we are. And there's no place in the world we can go without, you know, being welcomed into the family at home. And, and it's a wonderful, amazing thing to have this sense of a worldwide tribal community and family, especially since we're just the most crazily diverse bunch of people you could ever imagine in a belief in this structure. We would all be at each other's throats. You know? Or any of the other standard things, the cultural, racial, national, all the things that have used people have used to define themselves. But in the pagan community, you know, we're all we're all just brothers and sisters. You know, we're all children of the same mother, you know, and uh, and and the differences that we all have are are these precious, unique gifts that we each bring to the table. It's like having a big potluck. You know, everybody brings something new, and you don't want to fight about it. You want, oh, what do you got? You know, and I, th I think that's wonderful. I'm, I'm very pleased. I, I finally feel that after years of searching, I finally belong to the kind of a religion that I would, I feel proud to belong to, instead of embarrassed. You know, and, and we don't really have to argue about what people believe about whatever. It's not, it's not really an issue. We're all, we're all part of the same big family. So that all went really, really well. But in all those years of writing all these. Uh, editorials and of editing this magazine and doing all this work and, and traveling and, and everything that I've done, which has been, I've been kept pretty busy doing all this. Pretty much what I've done with my whole life is this stuff. Really, I've had very little time for much else. Even, even having a family has, has suffered at times, regrettably, for, for the amount of attention that I put into this. And a, a cautionary tale there that, uh, you know, is that Pay, pay attention to your family and the people close to you, too. And there have been times when I've not done nearly as much of that as I want to. This, you know, certain fanaticism has overtaken me. That this is like something that's so important. And it is. And, and, I, um, and, I, and I'm very glad to have had the privilege to have been given this assignment in my life. But, you know, but I've, I, I want to make sure everybody understands that um, I have not done this without some significant mistakes. Some lessons have to be learned the hard way. So it's always helpful to try to learn lessons from others who've already been there. <laughs> but there hadn't been anybody there before me there that I could learn lessons from. I had to kind of figure it all out. And, uh, 
Well, but over these nearly 50 years, I have learned a few things. And a few years ago, back in, no, let me see, 2002, I guess it was, um, well, a number of interesting things happened in my right here. Let's see if I can turn it. This is pretty nice and interesting. Um, the wizardry thing. I, I started becoming identified as a wizard really back in the 1980s and, and through the early 80s is when that became a strong identification. And the reason for that was at that time I was raising unicorns and taking them around to renaissance fairs. It seemed like the obvious venue. What do you do if you got a unicorn? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, come on, you don't go to the county livestock fair, you know. You know? Um, so renaissance fairs seemed like the perfect venue. Well, when you go to do a renaissance fair, you've got to have a costume and stuff for it, you know. The, the, obvious, the obvious costumes for my beloved Mind Glory and I were the, the wizard and the enchantress. And so we totally got that trip together. Well, Sometimes, you know, when you put on the pointy hat, you know, something just sort of takes over, you know? <laughs> your, your head grows pointy on top, you know, and, and you, you start looking at things differently, and people start looking at you differently, and um, over time I grew into the pointy hat and the robes and stuff, and, and started taking seriously, not, not just doing any crazy-ass thing that I enjoyed doing, which I, I certainly got a lot of mileage out of in my younger years, but started taking seriously um, the idea of, 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 of being a, an example. People started looking at me and expecting me to do something. So I figured, well, I, I had to kind of watch myself here and, and do the right thing, you know, do things that I would be proud of, that I would want people to take seriously instead of just crazy-ass stuff, which I had quite a history of. <laughs> <laughs> not, not any of which I regret. It was the 60s, after all. <laughs> and uh, and I, I didn't want to miss any of it, and I didn't. <laughs> <laughs>